topic of the day, mother and father wounding and how they present in fitness. So um, I definitely want to set a container for this conversation because it can be deep, it can be intimate, it can be hopefully not jarring, but it may be. So I want to be very careful and consensual in the way I set this container. Um, which I'm sure you understand if you're watching, if you felt pinged to come onto this IGTV based on the title and the topic, then um, I bet you understand a little bit of why um, setting the container is so important. So um, I'm going to review some patterns and behaviors and correlations today. Um, these are things that I've seen in my work. Um, these are probably the top seven most commonly recurring um, wounds, if you will, that I see present themselves uh, with my clients along their fitness journey. Um, so basically, mother and father wounding, you know, not just how they present in fitness, but how they can interrupt you when you're on your path, you know, on your fitness journey and striving to achieve a result, but you feel that there are blocks in the way coming up and consciously and logically, you understand how to get around these blocks, but there seems to be self-sabotage mechanisms that come up repeatedly. And perhaps you're feeling stuck and you're feeling confused and wondering, why do I keep messing myself up? Where is this coming from? So this is what I I'm really excited to address with you today. So keep in mind, I, I had about I had 12 or 13 that I had crunched out for this class and, um, I narrowed it down to seven for timing, <laughs> for timing's sake, so that this video doesn't, you know, take forever, take hours and hours. But please understand that there are so many variations and combinations to um, the wounds that I'm going to discuss. There are so many more than just the wounds that I'm going to discuss. Um, so number one, if you uh, feel like you have something, if I if I go over something and you feel like it's expressing itself in your life. Um, in your fitness journey, but you also feel like there's a little bit of another wound that I bring about, uh, bring into your awareness that is also presenting itself, that's totally normal. People can have a combination of these for sure. If you feel like none of these resonate, that's totally cool too. You either don't have something, you know, showing up in your fitness and maybe it's showing up in another area of your life, or maybe, you know, you have done a lot of your own personal work and you've done a great deal of healing and, you know, you're on the other side of the bulk of this all. That's awesome too. Um, also, if you're like, man, none of these land with me and I still feel like I'm having blocks and I can't lose the weight and I can't get into the shape and have the body that I want, there could be other factors going on that I don't go over today. And that's um, completely, you know, completely, uh, it has its place as well. So just because I don't go over a wound today it doesn't mean that it's not important. It doesn't mean that it doesn't have its place in psychology and mindset and um, you know different things and self-development. It's just I crunch them down to some of the most common recurring ones. Another thing I will say is I'm going to present these wounds as mother or father, and there's one that I'm going to present as both. If you feel that you have a wound, but you're like, man, this was more expressed with my mother um, or, you know, more with my father than what I'm presenting here, that's valid as well. So just um, always check in with your own inner guidance. Feel into whether or not this lands as your own personal truth. And if it does, cool, there's something to explore there. And if it doesn't, throw it out. No worries. <laughs> cool. Um, so let's see. I do want to go over my objective. Um, I, I want to say that, you know, I, I think I mentioned some of these things might ping or like sting a little bit or they're like, Ooh, like that feels like it might be truth, but that also feels like irritating. I don't want this to be my truth. That's okay too. Um, I want to just acknowledge you for building the self-awareness that you're building today. You're evolving today and you're taking emotional responsibility for your life as well as for your fitness journey. So that right there deserves applause. And it's, this is not an opportunity for you to get down on yourself, for you to go into a spiral of shame or um, you know, anything of that nature. This is 
definitely an acknowledgement of you being here, listening to this, having an open mind and, and looking for a way to better yourself, looking for a way to break through the blockages that you feel may be there in your life. So 100%, I acknowledge and I honor you for being here. And I want nothing but blessings and ease and flow in your fitness journey, for sure. So my objective today, ease shame, build greater self-love and self-forgiveness, um, highlight and bring awareness to what these blocks might be, and hopefully bring in some aha moments and ultimately make your fitness journey a little bit easier. That's what I'm here to do. That's what I want to do. Um, so about that container, this is a consensual container that we're going to set right now. So I'm going to do an intro on myself, a disclaimer, a self-compassion reminder, um, context on exactly what the heck mother and father wounding is, if you have no idea and you're new to this type of concept, um, and then a quick why, like why is this important for fitness? Really set that understanding um, before we dive into the information. So, number one, who am I? Who is me? <laughs> My name is Liam Price. If you are just settling in on um, some of my content for the first time. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I appreciate you taking the time and reserving some of your energy to, to, um, to get some of these concepts in. Uh, I'm a 12 year fitness coach, uh, fitness and weight loss coach. I am the founder of L3 method, which is a 12 to 16 week program for women. It's very VIP. It's very, um, high boutique. It's, um, an intimate, private and semi-private setting for women to um, achieve their weight loss and other fitness goals. And we go about it from the action steps. Yes, the all the exercise that's tailor fit to your body type and your metabolism and your goals, um, as well as the, you know, again, personalized nutrition. So nutrition that's catered to your taste buds, your schedule, your priorities, your goals and budget. In addition to all the, the doing, thing, all the action items, there are, um, you know, modules and things that we uh, go into depth with in L3 Method that develop and hold space for the EQ, the emotional intelligence behind fitness and behind falling back in love with our bodies and having optimal self-care and not just exercising that, you know, by way of optimal sleep, hydration, stress management, as well as the nutrition and the exercise, but also building these in as very, very stable, sustainable landing points in your life so that you don't go backwards again, so that you are self-sufficient. You don't need to keep hiring fitness coaches. You do this program, you graduate, you're good to go. So we've had a really high sustainability success rate, and I feel very fortunate and um, super stoked about that. All right, disclaimer, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a licensed psychologist. The information I provide today is for resources only, info resources only. Um, it's not to be taken as a diagnosis or, med or for medical treatment purposes. Um, please consult with your physician before starting an exercise or nutrition regimen um, and or prior to making any healthcare decisions regarding a specific medical condition. Additionally, here's the deal, here's the takeaway. What I share today, like I mentioned in the very beginning, gauge this against your own system your own truth, feel into what aligns and what does not, and just take and kind of like be at an information buffet right now. Just take what you want and just leave what you don't want. A reminder on the self-compassion, again, I just, I preach this all day long, self-compassion times a hundred. That is the one of the most important um, ingredients in this recipe towards sustainable weight loss and the body that you want. It's having self-compassion slowing down and quieting the inner critic, allowing yourself to understand the why behind the quirky things you do. Forgive yourself for those past mistakes because you were doing the best that you could with the information that you had, truly, truly. And now you get to move forward and, and try out some other things. Uh, cool. So yeah, that's, that's like the, that's honestly the foundation and the essence of consensual coaching. So coaching where I'm always honoring your yes, as well as your no. That's very, very important. Um, that's, that's like a cornerstone of my personal ethos with the way I coach and with my company. Um, that's huge. And 
This is also the basis for, let's say, an intuitive eating practice. If that's something you want to build into the future, if you want to create an intuitive eating, you know, if you want to have that in your life, just as an example, instead of constantly following a diet, let's say, um, that is like the first step to that is being really consensual, really, really connecting with what your own truth is and operating calmly and um, with discernment from that place. Cool. Um, again, if something I say pings a little bit, that's like a little bit of truth. It's rubbing up against something, potentially, potentially. And you get to explore that while still at the same time being gentle with yourself. So there's this there's this balance. I just made a meme about this, about have, like looking at your potential and reaching for that and also living from a place of peace so that the body can register that it's safe so that it can continue to do what it is that you want it to do. It's about having that growth that's spurned from being honest with yourself, taking a real honest look in the mirror and being like, hey, I'm not doing this. I'm being lazy. I'm being this, I'm being that, but also having compassion. Okay, so we understand the balance here. I'm really setting this up because there's some intense things that we're going to go over. So I really want to make sure this is understood. Also, even if there's a ping or a trigger or like an irritation, um, that could be a little bit of ego, a little bit of pride coming in. And that's okay too, because uh, oftentimes there's a little bit of like an ego death that takes place and it's okay. You know, it doesn't mean we're dying. It just means an old piece of us maybe falling away a little bit. So even if there is that like not super comfortable feeling as we talk about things that may land, there should also at the same time, and this is weird, but at the same time, there should be feeling this feeling of like coming home. So I always say the, the fitness journey is like, is truly like your, your journey home because it's the journey back into your own body and feeling safe maybe for the first time in your own skin feeling completely authentic in your own skin because your exterior is representing a true um, expression of what your interior is like. You know, the truth, the love, the power, the courage, the honesty, the, you know, just the sovereignty of all that is your essence. So we get to, you know, because this is fitness, we get to let the fitness look like the badass, you know, representation of all that good stuff on the inside. Okay. I also want to say if something does cut really deep, I am not here to drop a bomb and then be like, all right, figure it out on your own. Like here's some really challenging stuff. Let me open this wound for you again. And then let me peace out. I'm not about that. So if you feel like, oh my God, that really affected me. And you are feeling a little 911-ish, DM me. I'm here. That is my solemn promise. I'm not kidding about that. Shoot me a DM and we will continue this conversation off book and um, it'll be private, confidential. And that's 100% what I'm here for. This, honestly, this is, you know, this is my passion. Um, I want to help women remember who they are. I want to help them fall in love with their bodies again. And I want to um, help them to create a level of self-care that just, it makes sense. It's, it, it's aligning with their level of self-love. That's what I'm here to do. Help women look, feel their best, remember who they are. So DM me. Um, I'd be happy to speak further and, uh, you know, you can pick my brain all you want. All right. Quick one-on-one. What is mother and father wounding? <laughs> mother and father wounding, um, starts with the way we're brought up in the world from an early age. So it's the lens by which our parents see the world through, and then they pass that on um, through their children. And another preface here, do not think that, you know, mom and dad were bad parents or bad people, or they were trying to mess us up. They were doing the best they could. And I'm sure you have amazing parents. So this is not, this whole topic is not meant to be a slam on mother and father. It is absolutely not meant to, to do that. And trauma and wounding, often it doesn't look like abuse or really, of course, sometimes it does, but it, it's not always this really intense, over-the-top, um, 
horrible series of incidents or one singular incident, oftentimes we have really great relationships with our parents in adulthood. And oftentimes we remember our childhood as a lot better than it was. And again, that's no slam on our parents. They did the best that they could. But there were things that happened and it's okay. It's Parents are going to do their best and they're still going to mess us up. That's just part of being human. That's part of what happens. And then we get to have this journey back home to recreate and heal um, and optimize our lives. And, you know, it's like the, the passing of the baton forward. We come from DNA and, and a lineage of people who, you know, they didn't have the self-development work that we have now. They may have never gone through any type of healing process but they still were trying to keep us safe and show us love. And that's why we're here today, quite literally. So we honor and have tremendous reverence for what our parents, grandparents, and our ancestors went through just so that we could be here today. And also we get to level up. We get to continue the evolution cycle and we get to increase our quality of life um, by putting to bed and healing some of these wounds because that's what our ancestors want. They want us to have a good life. They want us to be happy and at peace and to enjoy being in our own bodies. Cool, so um, here's something that might sting a little bit, especially to my ladies. Um, we are, I've heard it said, and it does feel like truth to me, we are only the, we are only as developed as the least developed part of our mothers. And so I can feel my own ego and my own pride coming up when I say that, because I don't want to believe that's true. I want to feel like I'm, so much better and I'm awesome and there's nothing wrong. Um, but you know, that, that, that very likely in many cases is true. So, um, even though our ego and our pride may not want to stomach that with some self-compassion, something like that can really open us up to realize, oh, okay, this is why this is still happening because I see this less developed piece and it's resulting in this not being able to happen for me in my life now. So then when we can start to connect the dots, we can develop communication with the different parts of us that feel more or less developed and then grow from there. Okay, um, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, so core wounding, you know, oftentimes it's not abuse. It's not our parents being malicious. It's our parents want the best for us. It's they, they wanted to keep us safe. They wanted to show us love the best way they knew how. Um, and so early on, there were recurrences and there was information that got metabolized in our system from them and it kind of sticks in the system as trauma and so the body is continuing and the nervous system specifically through its different ways is continuing to try to keep us safe and to try to continue that um automate you know continue that stream that not constant stream but like that guaranteed stream of love to continue to flow towards us Okay, so now let's talk about why is this important in fitness. Mother and wounding, mother and father wounding in fitness, it relates to our core story. Well, what's that? Let's look at um, kind of the acronym BITFAR. So we have results, actions, feelings, thoughts, beliefs. I know that was a lot. Here's the difference. Here's the differentiation. Oftentimes fitness coaches, personal trainers and such will folk, you know, dietitians as well. They'll focus on the results and the actions at the bottom of that scale. And they'll spin their wheels with their clients and clients, even, you know, people who aren't working with any type of coach or nutritionist or what have you will spin their wheels because they're focusing on like, okay, I got to do the action so I can get the result, but it's not happening and it's not happening or it's happening 80% or something different is happening or, you know, and it's like, there's just this stuck feeling and it's because we're not addressing all the things that are governing those actions. Emotion always precedes action. Emotion, although it's fleeting, although it's ever changing, emotion governs everything that's going on on the planet, even with, you know, things that are not human. <laughs> um, so, Behind actions are thoughts. Thoughts are like the reasons why we're going to do the action. And then behind those thoughts are feelings, emotions. And then behind, and those feelings are usually like one word. Like I feel anxious. I feel scared. I feel peaceful. And then behind the actions is a core belief. And that's usually a short sentence, much shorter than the thoughts. And that core belief 
is running the show. So I'll let that land. The core beliefs that we have about ourselves, and there's only a few, those core beliefs, which I'm going to aim to like land on so that hopefully one or two of them are like, ah, that feels like something that is going on inside of me. Those core beliefs are running all of the actions. They're running the emotions. They're running the thoughts. Cool. Um, so that's why mother and father wounding is important in fitness because our core story, our core belief, AKA <laughs> is um, sprouted from the mother and father wound. All right. I'm going to go over the structure of the seven that I will review. First, I'm going to name the wound. Then I'm going to say if, if it's mother or father, I'm going to talk about the core stories created from the wound and how it shows up in life. Um, and then examples of how it presents in fitness with the correlating gifts and the challenges. Again, keep in mind, there are dozens and dozens of variations on these. So if you feel like you have some combo or you feel like one's more mother or father or both for you, or you feel like there's something not mentioned here, yes, it's true. There are many, many more to go over. We're just doing what we have time for today. These are just, in my 12 years being a fitness coach, these are the seven combos that I've seen frequently show up in my work. All right, number one, blah, 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 blah. Another, number one wound, and these are not in order, by the way. Number one wound, self-betrayal. <sighs> okay, this is a mother wound. Um, what are the core stories sounding like? I'm not safe to be me. I'm not safe to have my needs met. Uh, I'm not safe to be sovereign in my own emotionality. I'm not safe to experience my own emotions. So one of those core stories. How it happened. Um, sometimes it's from competition. Sometimes this can show up as a sister or a sibling wound because of that competition. Um, Self-betrayal is often linked to us wanting to ensure that steady stream of love. And if we don't, if we are asking to get our needs met somewhere in our early childhood, that was shut down and there was a cut off. There's like a cut off from the stream of love, meaning like, it, and it can, it, it can expand in so many different ways. It can be like, there's not enough room here for your emotions because maybe there is a sick parent and that parent had, had needed, required a lot more attention. Maybe there was a sick sibling, you know? Um, maybe there was um, someone who was very, very insecure. You know, maybe the, the parent was insecure, so therefore the child couldn't be too happy, child couldn't be too confident, the child couldn't be too wrapped up in their own dreams and wishes and desires because the parent, um, you know, had needed the priority of their own needs to be met in some way. Um, so how this can look, here's one example of how this looks in life. There are many different versions, so many, but one can be like the clown jokester deflector. So basically, um, the need to make sure that everyone, these are often empaths, the one who do the subtle self betrayal. So we have this requirement that everyone around us feels comfortable so that we can settle our own systems down. So if it means self deprecation via like joking around with ourselves, you know, making ourselves be the butt of the joke, being the clown to lighten up the room, to make everything feel lighthearted, to be the jokester, um, you know, that's what we'll do to deflect. Or if, there is a moment where there's space being held for us to have emotions and for us to have our own need, needs met. That's so foreign to us. And it's so uncomfortable to be in the receiving position versus the giving position that will deflect um, in order to make sure that everyone else feels comfortable. Or that's what we're thinking in our head. That's the story. That's the lens. That's the filter that we're seeing things through. I hope I can hold my voice through this whole thing. I'm like, it's already getting scratchy. <laughs> I haven't talked really at all today, so I don't know why um, I'm losing my voice. So I apologize. I hope that I hope that it's it's good. Maybe I'll do a sip of water here. <sighs> cool. So another thing with the competition is, let's say mom um, didn't feel pretty and and daughter was pretty, and so 
mom didn't feel like special and she didn't feel like she was getting attention from father or from whoever. So daughter in adult life will now play down her attributes, play down her beauty in order to make other women around her feel beautiful. And obviously that doesn't accomplish the goal. Obviously other women feeling beautiful is not her responsibility. Her only responsibility is to show up and be authentic and feel good about herself and feel like, you know, normal. Like this is who I am. This is what I am, whatever. Um, so that's the subtle self-betrayal I'm talking about. And it can be a gateway to bigger things. That overcompensation so that others can get their needs met can really put us like in this losing game when it comes to trying to get fit. Okay, now here's why, here's why we're all here. How are we gonna connect these two? Um, so the gifts, you're a team player. Um, if you're on a sports team, you are absolutely helping other people look like all-stars. You absolutely wanna see others win. If you're in a weight loss group of some kind, you're cheering the others on, you're making other people feel special and you're holding them high. And that's truly a beautiful gift that comes from this, 100%. Um, you're considerate of others' feelings. Yeah, you just you lift others up. Here are the challenges. I'm going to give some examples of how this presents in fitness. You're in an exercise class, and you're with a girlfriend, and it's a little bit advanced. Maybe it's a CrossFit. Maybe it's a Pilates. Maybe it's a Zumba class. And your girlfriend is like lagging behind. She's not getting it. She's just, it's not working out for her. Um, and instead of you, even though you're proficient in what's being taught in the class and what's being executed, you um, start to clown around to make your girlfriend feel better. So what's happening in that scenario? Now you're not getting the most out of that class. You're not like seeing through to your own potential and getting really, really fit. You're just like messing around and the class is essentially a wash because you can sense that empathetic feeling that your girlfriend is like embarrassed or having a tough time. So you betray your own goals and your own needs to really like give it your all in that class just so that she can feel like comfortable and not too small. Um, Okay, here's another example of self-betrayal. You are on a new nutrition plan. It's healthy, it's amazing, you're doing well, and you know that there are certain restaurants where you can go and stay on plan. And then there's other restaurants where um, you'll, you'll go and there just won't be anything healthy for you to eat. So your group of girlfriends want to go out to eat and they want to go to that unhealthy restaurant. And you just, you don't speak up, you just go along with it and you say, all right, well, I guess tonight I'm going to be, I'm going to succumb to whatever uh, temptations are at this restaurant and that's going to be that. And then you put yourself further behind the eight ball to um, achieving your weight loss goals. So you're, you're constantly putting other needs before other people's needs before your own. And that is a beautiful attribute until it becomes excessive. And then what happens is you never realize you are full potential. You could do it if you lived in a vacuum. You could do it if you were all alone and there was no one pulling on you to make themselves feel good or worthy. But because that's not the world, you know, that's not the world you live in, live in, you are around others, people you love and care about. You can't help because this was a mechanism that was developed in early childhood. It's like on autopilot. You just, you default to what that other person needs in that moment more than what you need. And then your goals don't get accomplished. Um, you don't set those boundaries. So here's another example. You uh, are, you got all, all your stuff packed, you're in your workout clothes, and you're going to drive to the gym if there's a gym open near you right now. Um, or you're going to go down to your basement and do your workout. And it's on your to-do list and it's scheduled in and you're cool. Your friend calls you. She's in total breakdown. You know that you only have 45 minutes to get your workout done so you can stay on track. Your girlfriend is, she just broke up with her boyfriend. She's so upset. She is like saying, I need you. I, da, 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 I need you here. She's not asking you, hey, do you have the capacity to hold space for me right now? She's just bombarding you with her own emotions. And she's like, Without meaning to, she's not a bad person, but she's like putting all of that responsibility on you and your heart goes out to her, you drop everything you're doing and then you you 
you're there for her instead of doing your workout. No, that's okay. That's amazing, again, to do once in a while. But if you find that that's constantly happening, you're constantly dropping your plans to get fit, to, do, to acquiesce other people and their needs, this is an issue. Okay, so do we see how this traces back to an original wound? Um, so questions you could ask yourself if you think this may be something that's going on with you. Uh, where am I committing very self, very subtle self-betrayal at this point in my life, or not so subtle? Um, when do I walk away from people, situations, or events and feel kind of crappy? And, you know, not coming at that from a self-blame place, meaning, okay, um, I must feel crappy because it's my fault because I didn't get enough sleep last night or I drank too much caffeine or um, whatever, whatever. But maybe what's underneath that is like, I don't feel good because that person doesn't respect my boundaries. I just subtly self-betrayed for this person. And now I'm out of alignment with myself. Like I, I broke a promise to myself. I said I was going to do this thing and I didn't do it because my friend took up all the oxygen in the room and she needed me. And this is the eighth time this has happened this month. So now I don't feel good, but I'm, I can't just blame it on the weather anymore or on other circumstances. Maybe I don't feel good because A, this person is not like treating me as an autonomous person with my own needs. And B, I'm constantly self-sabotaging self and self-betraying and breaking promises to myself to stay on plan. Um, another question, when do I take on the pain of others, carry responsibility that is not mine to carry? And when did that maybe start? Like if you think of a memory when that started happening. All right, let's do the second wound. So this one is a father wound and it is the external locus of identity wound. Okay, the story, the core story behind this. I'm not smart enough. Uh, I'm not capable. I can't do it on my own. I can't figure it out on my own. How did it happen? Often what I see is a daddy's little girl type of complex, this type of like almost dependency that was formed, like your daddy's little girl, like you can stay under my wing. You don't need to branch out into the world and stand on your own two feet. Like daddy's got you. Again, this is beautiful. Daddy, dad, <laughs> father meant well. Um, or the opposite happens dad was absent or dad was abusive or neglectful emotionally or in some other way or dad in some way um, withheld love or there was a in a more severe case there was a warped um, something warped happened something that was um, very unhealthy and toxic occurred or was occurring for like you know repeated times that caused the young girl to go into a free state and she um, she just, she abandoned her own um, inner sense of guidance because she was being gaslighted and said, okay, well, what daddy says, like, is what goes. What dad thinks must be the truth. And I'm going to constantly look outside of myself for the truth now. Okay, so it's, it's one of the two. It's either the doting, very like loving, but maybe to the point of smothering or maybe to the point of like overdoing it type of energy or it's the neglectful absent energy. Okay, how does this show up in life? Um, where we can be in a constant freeze state or instead of freeze, like the inability to take action from your own like autonomous space, there's this other thing that can happen which is like a shiny bouncing sparkly object chasing state. So this manifests as almost like a damsel in distress, um, looking to be saved, the savvy constantly being let down by others because, you know, she's looking to be saved and it's, it's not happening. Um, and there's a stop and start that, that also occurs, um, in fitness, in life, in careers, so on and so forth. Challenges. Um, well, let's talk about gifts first. The gifts, this type of person is often very, very coachable. She's very open to feedback. She's humble. Um, she has an open mind um, often, not all the time. None, none of these are like always, always the standard. It's just often, you know, this is what we see. Challenges. Um, here's an example. So if we, let's take water. All right. I, I hold this wound and I have to 
make sure I stay hydrated every day. And I just, I can't quite get it right. So I'm gonna find this beautiful, sparkly, amazing unicorn of a water bottle to help me track my water. And then we get bored with that. And, and we think that's gonna answer everything. We put our whole, like we, we hang our whole tie on that. That's gonna be the answer. Something outside of me is going to save me, is going to make all of this work for me. It doesn't work. All right, now I'm gonna try a water app. That didn't work, so I'm gonna try the next thing. This, we're chasing the shiny object. This thing is gonna be the thing that makes it all work out for me. And so there's never this coming home to, ah, I have the answers within myself. I can do this um, on my own two feet, but it's gonna come from within. That's not the natural state. That's not the natural come from for someone with this wound. Um, workout equipment and the next fad diet, like that, that can be more of the same type of thing as the water bottle. All right, I'm gonna get this like really cool new, like bright pink sandbag and I'm gonna do these sandbag workouts and they're gonna, that's gonna be the trick. Like this is gonna work for me. This is gonna be perfect. And then we get bored with it and we think, all right, well, that wasn't it. Maybe there's something else I can now do that um, is gonna be the answer. And we're looking to be saved by that workout program. I know that sounds crazy, but it happens. Same thing with fad diets. Okay, the keto diet is, I, I, the keto diet is like my punching bag. Like I just, I can't, it's freaking keto. But <laughs> the keto diet is gonna like make all my dreams come true. And we follow the keto diet for two weeks. We never check in and make sure that it aligns with us and goes with our, you know, schedule and our, our genetic, make, genetic makeup. And then we just fall off. And so we're like, okay, then it's gonna be the next thing. It's gonna be the next thing. And there's this distraction that takes place and that's what keeps us from the goal. Here's why the ego will continue to chase the shiny, shiny sparkling object. This is why the ego will continue to distract and avoid because it doesn't understand intrinsically. There's no visceral understanding of what it's like to accomplish something completely independently standing on our own if we have this wound. Therefore, what we don't viscerally understand because we've never experienced it before, the ego interprets this as fear. So, or ex excuse me, it interprets this as, da as danger. What's unknown seems dangerous. And that's okay, that's, that's our DNA. That's that part of our brain that's kept us safe for millennia, you know, our lineages rather. So that fear-based part is like, okay, well, we don't know what that's like. So we're not even gonna, we're gonna keep ourselves safe from that. So it's safer to just keep going around in a circle, trying the next thing and trying the next thing and trying the next thing, and then we never see through to our fullest potential. So that was a lot there. Let's see if I've missed anything. Um, okay, another thing is with coaching. Often this daddy's little girl, um, external locus of identity um, or truth, we can also say, this, this type of wound will present with a fitness coach as like, you're going to save me. And there will be a focus on, it's a different type of shiny object, but the focus will be on like, let me ask the perfect, the right questions. Cause if I just ask the right question, then like I'll get, I'll get it and everything will fall into place. So they focus on asking a million questions and all these, they wanna know detail after detail after detail of everything. And they wanna know every, every like life hack, all the things. But when you do that, you're never present to the answers. So the coach can't transmit the information to you because you're not listening. You're not really there. Your head is up here thinking about the next thing. I hope this, this makes sense. Okay, um, so questions to ask for this wound. Uh, the questions would be around sovereignty. You know, where am I not practicing sovereignty in my own life? Where am I not... Um, acting as a sovereign being? Um, where am I building imaginary mountains in my life and then running from them and avoiding them? Where am I chasing shiny objects? What circles am I actually in that I may not previously have been aware of that are keeping me circling around the target but never actually like getting to the target? And what was my relationship like? With my father or my mother this may have you know been something made it taken a different shape or with another um, strong father figure maybe a grandfather in your life and where can i take more of this onto my own shoulders even if it seems scary but just 
like tiny pieces and move forward in this way. All right, let's move on to the next one. Wound number three, uh, codependency slash fear of abandonment. So we'll just, we'll call it the codependency wound. This is a mother, we're gonna flip back to a mother wound. The story is um, circling around, I must sacrifice my own empowerment for love. So there is a exchange. I must sacrifice my own empowerment to continue to receive love. Uh, how does this, how does this, uh, you know, happen? Um, typically, and I, and I'm going to, okay, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to provide a buffer around it. I should probably do the opposite, but typically this comes from an emotionally manipulative mom. And she, okay, here's the buffer. She doesn't mean to. <laughs> She's a good person. She's a good mother. And she loves you so much. It's just what she knows. This is how she understands life through manipulation. And it's it's normal for maybe the culture or the family background. And she's not a bad person. But there's a great deal of, there's a codependency. So there's a, a manipulation so that the mother is making sure she's still receiving love from the child. It's like flip-flops. And so then the, the child is like, oh, I'm going to do the thing. You know, I'm going to put on the mask so that I can continue to receive love from her. Because when she feels good, then I'm going to be okay. If she doesn't feel good, she may abandon me. And that's really scary, especially when we're young. And then that lives on into adulthood, which, again, self-compassion. Forgive yourself. If you're like, I'm a grown-ass adult. I'm a 40-year-old woman, and I'm still... Scared my mom's going to abandon me? What? It's okay. A lot of us have this going on. And we don't consciously always understand it. I think that I have this. I'm still exploring. I have this in some very, very, like, like small or, like, multiplied removals. <laughs> this makes sense. Like, removed several times. I have this, I think. Um, and, but it happened when I was really, really young. So I don't fully understand. And I, the more I explore it, the more it opens up understanding for things that are happening in my life now. So I'm grateful for that. Um, so I'm just, there's zero judgment here is all I'm saying. Um, okay. So how does this show up in life? Uh, it's the people pleaser. It's incredible amounts of self-sabotage, um, and incredible amounts of anxiety typically. Someone who has an anxious or manipulative or living in fear mom has an incredible amount of anxiety in their own system, especially if they were close to mom. If they're not very close to mom, then um, they can get away from some of that. But constantly the nervous system is in that sympathetic fight or flight I know there's the freeze and the fawn, but with this one, it's it's kind of those first two, and it's it's just it's always there and it's running in the background. So someone like this understands life through a lens of like there's constantly this low running like like it's it's always right there. There's an anxiety level that they are so used to they don't know life without it at this point that um, it's running the show and they don't even have much comprehension around that. Let's tie this into fitness. Actually, before I do that. Um, also I want to say, here's other ways in which this may have happened. Um, mother's super insecure, uh, other family members, super insecure, tons and tons of siblings. Like sometimes there are, and I have so much compassion for this, for anyone who's listening, who has dealt with this. There are just so many mouths to feed. There were so many children with needs that there is a feeling like if I don't do exactly what is needed to stand out or to um, make my mom feel good, then I'm going to get lost in the shuffle and a closed mouth won't get fed. So I'm, I better perform. I better do what is needed from her to feel good. So that therefore I can feel good. That's like, you know, the crux of codependency, correct? Also, high pressure traditions with family. So some cultures, there's such an expectation that you will subvert any uh, 
autonomous or independent um, desires or, you know, a stepping out of your own identity, like this is very much true with those in um, the L LGBTQ community who step out and they say, hey, this is what, what I am, this is how I identify. And there's so much fear there because for them to say, I am separate from this family, I love my family, I come from my family and I respect and honor these traditions. And also I'm gonna take like a, a little bit of a different path for myself. And there can be this crushing blowback from the family. And then there's a decision for that individual to make. Do I self-sabotage? Do I do I suppress and part ways with, with some of my identity to please the family so that they continue to love me and they don't abandon me? Or do I just swallow it and keep going and keep doing what they want? So it's really tough. Um, it can be really, really tough. And this can happen from a mild scale to a severe scale. And everything is valid. If this is happening to you mildly it's still or has happened, it's still there. It still has happened. It's still micro trauma and it's valid and your feelings are valid and how you, um, how you're feeling the blocks and you're not able to get past some stuff today because of all of that is 100%. It has a place. It's valid. And you get to love that piece of you that maybe feels unlovable because others in your family told you that it wasn't lovable, but it is, and you can love it. Okay, fitness, <laughs> man, I'm like going so into my heart space with this, um, but I really do, I, I feel I feel it for you. Um, so gifts, uh, you're open to new information, uh, another massive gift, you guys are very loving and caring, very supportive, very thoughtful, very like just giving, and you have that motherly like essence, like, you know, with others, like I got you, I'm here for you. Um, challenges. There's a deep fear of trying something new. And this is because the anxiety is right there, like we talked about. So think about there's this anxiety. Anxiety stems from fear. Add more fear because doing something that's unknown into the mix, that's too much for the system to take. The system is already at almost at max capacity. It's like a little bit too much. It's overload. So and still, until some of that is taken down a bit, it's hard for the body to take in something new and really go out on a limb and, and be brave and, and go to a, an unknown territory, which has to happen if we want to put new things into our brain and our mindset to pave a new way for ourselves to have healthier bodies. If this is the mind that got you this body, you got to put new stuff in to have a different result. Yes, but this can be scary for someone who has a lot of anxiety. Um, also, there's a fear of, like we said, stepping out on one's own, taking action. Uh, so there's a, so this is where it gets dicey, but interesting. First of all, the less dicey version, there's a codependency that often can happen with workout partners. So, okay, we're going to work out on Tuesdays and Thursdays every week. Cool. So then Tuesday, we work out together. It was amazing. Thursday rolls around that morning, a few hours prior um, your workout buddy calls you and sa or texts you and says, I'm not going to make this workout for ABC reason. So because you were like so dependent on them showing up and that like made you feel worthy of that workout almost, you're just like, okay, well, I'm not going to go now. So you bail on yourself because you needed that person and that's not truly sustainable because that person's not always going to be there. Like life lives. And I'm not meaning that in a morbid sense. I'm just saying like, you don't know what's going to happen in the future. Your friend could move. They could have new responsibilities on their plate. You're not in control of anything but your own actions and your own attitude, right? So if you know from a, like a solid place that I'm going to get the job done, no matter who shows up, who doesn't show up, what they want, where their head's at, if they're moody, whatever, I'm still going to do me. That's very hard for someone with this wound to, to like embody. Okay, here's the more dicey version. This is so cool, but it's like, what? There's a codependency that can happen within our own, um, within our, with our own bodies. What the heck does that mean? Okay, so someone who's anxious, they are like, I'm gonna do this. I'm really fearful. This is new and unknown, but I'm gonna do this new workout plan. All right, go. They wanna see a result right now. Like, 
okay, body, I treated you poorly for six years, but in one week, you better drop 20 pounds for me. And I'm exaggerating, of course, but like, I better see something happen right now, even though like I've done so much neglect now that I'm paying attention, like I want an immediate result and that's not how it works. If you kind of like separate, I know this sounds like Looney Tunes, but if you separate a little bit yourself and then your body and you kind of look at the body as its own entity, the body wants tender love and care. The body wants proof that it can trust you. The body wants to follow you, but the body also knows it's a lot wiser than your crazy brain that's gonna logicify anything. The brain can make anything seem logical. Unfortunately, that's why cults exist. That's why horrible things have happened in this world because this can make anything make sense. But this is the truth. And this is the truth. It's just a lot quieter than this. So if we believe that the soul is sending messages through, you know, physical sensations and through that small inner voice, then we can start to put together like, ah, when I feel my lower back hurting, uh, I'm going on a tangent. I got, I should stick. Sorry. I get really passionate, but, um, I'll, I'll stick with, that'll be another conversation about low backs and messages physically being transmitted. Uh, <laughs> and I know some of you, I'm losing you. You're like, all right, you're getting too woo woo for me. Like stick to the science, stick to the psychology. Okay. Will do. I'm, I hear you loud and clear. <laughs> Um, but yes, with, with our own bodies, there can be this codependency that takes place. Like I'm going to be kind to you, but you better give me a result right now, or I'm going to, I'm going to fall off track. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to do these nice things, but if I don't see like you give me something back immediately, then I'm bailing when instead it's this relationship where if you've overdrawn on the bank account with your body for years and years and years, you're at this deficit. And you have to put these love deposits in. You have to put these self-care deposits in. You have to put this TLC in. Deposit, 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 deposit before you can hit the zero balance and then start to see a surplus. I hope this makes sense. Here's another analogy that I'll pull out of the, pull out of the roster. Um, okay, so you're dating someone and they cheat on you. What does it take for that person? I'm going to link this to your body. What does, that take, what does it take for that person to earn you back? And that's going to be a different answer for everyone. I'm just going to pull things out. Okay, that that cheating person um, sends you a dozen roses. Is that going to win your favor? Like, are you going to be like, okay, cool, we're good now. No problem. No, probably not. Most likely, you're like, hey, I'm worth a lot more than that. All right, you better, you better show up and show me. <laughs> so it's not just going to be a dozen roses, right? Okay, how about two dozen roses? Okay, it's better than a dozen, but still. And then it's gonna be a card and a love note. And then it's gonna be uh, you know, full admission of guilt and wrongdoing and begging forgiveness. And it's gonna be apology upon apology upon apology. It's gonna be a, a sit down with family and friends. I will do anything to get this woman back. It's gonna be, do you see what I'm saying? More and more and more, there's going to be this outpouring of love and TLC before the person who has cheated on will trust the cheater ever again. And they may never trust them again, but that's another, that's a whole other thing. So take that analogy and apply that to your body. You are so mean to your body for, let's say, three years. You sit on the couch, you don't move, you sit in traffic, you never stretch, and you're like at the computer like this all day. You've turned into like a human S shape. <laughs> you have been eating McDonald's in and out and Taco Bell like, every single day for three years. You um, don't sleep very much. You stay up late every night watching Netflix and drinking beer and you get like three hours of sleep a night. I'm really going for it here. Um, you never drink any water. You're stressed to the gills at work. You've really just put your body through it. Your body's number one job is to keep you alive. It's going to keep you alive and try to keep you safe no matter what you throw at it. So it's pretty incredible. The people that you see walking around that don't live these healthy lifestyles, but they're still trucking that when I see that, I'm like, that's, inc that's amazing. That's such a gift. It's like the human body is so incredible and so resilient. And now when you start to do the healthy practices and you start to show your body love, it's not just going to be a dozen roses. It's not going to be one salad. 
it's not going to be one week of stretching. It's going to take time. But if we have a codependent relationship with our bodies, because that's what we learned from our mothers of how love is and how love is to be interpreted and how love is to be given and received. If that's all we know, then that's how we're going to show up for our bodies. And it's like, you're trying to uproot your seed as soon as you plant it with your body. Okay. There is a lot of self-sacrifice that goes on with this type, with, with this wound, um, in order to have continued closeness with the family, which of course, underneath that all is to continue that love stream with your family. So we already like touched on this. Certain cultures will say, excuse me, you're not going to eat the lamb pie. I don't know. <laughs> you're not going to eat the, the dessert that your aunt so-and-so brought over. You're not going to eat the, the, the fattening, horrible, like cholesterol-y, heart disease producing entree. <laughs> I'm, is, I'm going over the top, but you're not going to eat that thing that grandma made with so much love for you. What's wrong with you? Like, are you disrespectful? I always say this. I apologize if you've watched my other content and you're hearing this for the 12th time, but what you put in your body is an extremely personal decision. What you eat goes into your system, gets digested, and turns into a part of your body for the next seven years of your life because cells turn over every seven years. So what you're eating is going to become a part of you, of your physical being in this life, walking through on this in this life on this plane. So yes, we want to be respectful and we want to love grandma and we want to love auntie so-and-so and we want to thank them and respect them for all the hard work they put into the food for the traditional holiday dinner or what have you. And also we get to have boundaries and boundaries are like the biggest challenge for this uh, type of wound. Um, okay. So questions to ask, how did I get love from my mom growing up? What did I do? What mask did I have to wear to ensure that steady flow of love? Remember, masks create misalignment. We put on a mask, we're no longer being our authentic selves. And then we keep going in life with that mask on. And at first it's not too bad. And then we veer and we veer and we veer and we veer off track. And then all of a sudden we wake up one day and we're so far off track. We're so down that road of misalignment because we've had this mask on for so long and we had it for good intentions. That's why, again, self-compassion, you did it because that's what you knew. And when you take that mask off, it's scary to let the world see you for you. Oh my gosh, I have needs. Oh my gosh, I'm different than my, than my mom. Oh my gosh, I can go do something for myself that's going to give me pleasure. And she may not like it, but I'm not hurting her by doing that. See what I'm saying? Okay. Number four, I could go off on these for a while. I'm try I know it's like, I'm already in an hour. Um, I'm only on number four. Okay. Number four, lone wolfing. Father, father wound, story, I'm not safe, I'm all alone. No one's in my quarter. It's me against the world. How it happened. Father couldn't contain a young child's life force. Father couldn't be the, the, the larger container. Uh, when child was freaking out, spazzing out, um, you know, that wasn't contained. It was either made to feel wrong. It was like, okay, it's your way. So the child became really big for their britches early on and realized like, oh, I just, I just smashed my hero. And, and obviously I don't mean physically, but like, oh, there's this weirdness in the hierarchy. So, and of course this can, this can absolutely be a mother wound as well. But from an early age, like three to five, three to six, four to six, somewhere around three to six, we'll say, um, there's this coming online of the child's autonomy. And they like, they're like, it's going to be my way. They throw the tantrum and win. They have the fight and they win the fight, whether it's with the siblings or the parents. So it, it feels like too big for the child because they're not ready to be the, the parent. They're not ready to be the authority. They're not ready to be the stronger one. They're not ready to see their superhero die. I don't mean that in the real sense. You see what I'm saying? Like the proverbial sense. So 
there's like this, oh my God, like there's no bigger force that's protecting me, that's holding me, that's showing me the way. I have to figure this all out on my own. I gotta like, I gotta be the boss here. I gotta be the one who's going to make shit happen. Excuse my language. Make stuff happen because um, nobody else is, is gonna do that for me. So it's like the opposite of the daddy's little girl. Um, like, how does this show up in life? I can't rely on anyone else to help me. I have to figure it out on my own. There can be some rigidity there for sure. Uh, rules in place, defiant, rebel, their own boss. And I mean that literally, like this is what I resonate with. So it's a, um, I have to be in business myself. I'm an outdoor cat. I can't be employed. Like I have a problem with authority. Someone will get fired a lot because they're defiant. Um, they'll have anger issues. They'll have aggression. So aggression is the emotional, irresponsible equivalent to anger. Anger is a, is a good emotion to have. Anger is a very powerful emotion. But anger that's like placed on, that's projected onto others and, it's, and it shouldn't be, is aggression, if that makes sense. Um, also in life, how this shows up, these people are very slow to trust. The gift of that is they're extremely loyal once they do. When you have earned a place in this person's inner circle, psh, you're in. You're, they believe in you. They trust you. They put a lot of stock into their friendships that are like their real friendships. But it can be volatile too. It can be a little bit codependent as well because it's like, you. Better, there's like a lot of, um, because they don't have that parent figure holding them, they take that like feeling and they'll like sometimes without meaning to, they'll project it onto their friends and it feels like very heavy on their friend's shoulders. Like, well, geez, I gotta be like an extra solid. I gotta always be on point for this person. And so there can be like this um, subtle pressure. Um, also, this is like a gift and a curse. They don't care. Well, I'm gonna say it's a curse. I'm gonna say it's a challenge. They don't care about quality of life <laughs> as much as others. They care about being safe more than they care about being loved. So they are, they don't put as much stock in a pleasure. Am I enjoying this? I don't care if I'm enjoying it. I'm getting the job done. I don't care if I enjoy this. This is going to determine, this is going to end in a result that's going to do the thing that I want, which if you boil down to it, it's a keep me safe. So make more money, that's gonna keep me safe. Make me look hot, body, fitness, keep me safe. Uh, you know, whatever it is, it's gonna allow me to still have a place in the world and feel worthy and feel valuable. I don't know if that makes, I hope that makes sense. How this presents in fitness. Here's the gift. They will get the job done. <laughs> so they're not going to, they're not going to be putting stock in shiny, bouncing, sparkling objects. They're going to, okay, what's the, what's the objective? What's A to B? What's the, what's the path here? And then they're going to execute like a mad person, mad woman, mad man. They will do the thing. They will stay the course. Here's the challenge. They'll stay the course 18 miles in the wrong direction because they're so pigheaded and they're so stubborn. And I'm talking to myself. This is me, okay? <laughs> so, so much, so little, no judgment and so much compassion here. Um, so they stand on their own two feet. This is a gift. They take self-responsibility. They're tough, they're strong, um, and they often have advanced cognitive processing because they, like I said, they had to figure all the, they had to figure things out on their own. They weren't like, Hey, can you help me with this? They're like, all right, I'm going to Google this because nobody's going to tell me. And, or like maybe someone was there to help them. Maybe someone was offering help but for whatever reason, the story was created. Like, I can't trust this person to deliver things that will help me. I've been betrayed by this, this parent, or I've been led astray. Like this parent, I've taken advice from this authority figure of this parent before and it seriously screwed me up so there's that issue with authority now when this shows up in fitness with like hiring a fitness coach they'll logically understand i should hire a fitness coach i want to get fit i have a lot on my plate right now i don't have all the time in the world to do all the research into the science and into my own body type and like what exactly I need. So let me accelerate this process and hire the coach. They logically understand that, but they do the thing, which is they hire the coach and then they have such an issue being coachable. 
So they'll, I've seen this so many times and I, I laugh because it's, it's me too, but like they'll hire the coach and they'll be like, okay. And they think they're doing the thing, but in their own head, there's still this stubbornness and there's still this inability to receive information because they have no idea how to receive because no one, they, their story, their core wound, their core story is nobody's here to help me. Nobody's got my back. Do you see how that correlates to the lack of receiving? They can't receive help because they don't know what that's like. Um, or it's very unnatural. They haven't done it much. They're not well versed in receiving help. So they think that they're receiving help, but then they don't, they don't actually get to where they need to go because they won't let any new information in because there's this subverted belief system. No matter like these people aren't really here to help me. Like consciously, I hired this fitness coach, I'm paying the money. She's gonna help me. But subconsciously, there's still this distrust. It's still like a, I don't know, like I am not good with authority. I'm not good with someone telling me what to do. I can't trust that they really have my best interests at heart. So my heart goes out to you guys who resonate with this. I I feel you. Um so there's this block. Information can't get in because it's another form of receiving. Receiving information is just another form of receiving support or help. Okay, here's something else that manifests in fitness with this type. They will inflict pain on their own bodies. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so this, this wound runs aggression oftentimes, not always, sometimes. To let the aggression out, what society has bolstered up as a healthy way to do so is like, go hit a punching bag, go work out, go like get the energy moving. Is this true? Yes, absolutely. But it's a very fine line um, between healthy and unhealthy um, letting the energy out. So because they're so in their head and there's just like steam coming out of their ears, they're bypassing the emotions behind the anger. So something that we're very comfortable with is anger as like the prevailing emotion. Um, Cause we're always in fight, right? That's our nervous system response. But what we're uncomfortable with is what's behind the, what's behind the anger. Anger super comfortable. So I'm from Jersey. I'm like angry. No problem. I got you angry and passionate. That's me. So, <laughs> but what's behind that deep, deep sadness deep, deep fear. And if any men are going to listen to this, this is very hard for them to wrap their heads around because to be fearful doesn't feel manly. To be sad doesn't feel manly. To be angry does feel manly. But there's a child inside the men and the women or however you identify. And that child's really, really scared. And there's a few points of removal. There's some walls there that have been built to keep that very tender, very vulnerable part of you safe. And so they're walled off with that anger. So what does that lead to? A really intense disconnection with our bodies. So that disconnection can create injury. Injury derails us from achieving our fitness goals because if we go too hard out of the gate, we ignore our body signals to stop, to slow down. Don't do those reps because, you know, those last few reps because the program says to or because it feels good up here. Maybe, you know, I'm feeling pain. Push through the pain. Don't be a puss. That's a very old way of doing fitness. Doing fitness and being fit. We are now realizing do not, they don't, they're not hand in hand. Doing fitness is not necessarily sustainable. Being fit is, but being fit requires emotional intelligence and emotional intelligence requires connection to the body, requires validating emotions, not just the angry ones, but the ones that are driving, driving the angry ones. So when we are like, let's get the aggression out and we're working out, you are getting, be mindful, you're getting aggression out on your own body because you're moving your body. And that's okay if you have discernment and if you have a humility to your body. So I still have this. It comes up and I'm like, I need to move. I feel like I'm going to blow up. Arr! I have that. But at the same time, this is, is president. This is queen. She's going to tell me when it's time to stop. And I bow to her. My bot body, specifically my lower back because of my two surgeries um, a few years ago, my, are going to tell me 
no, you're not doing that. Yes, you're doing that. Okay, now it's time to stop. You're going to do that at half mass, like whatever it is. She runs the show when it comes to working out. So challenge in summary, the second big challenge we addressed here with this type of wound is um, there is like subtle self damage or self inflicted um, pain. What was the word I used? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know where it is, but okay. Um, yeah, there's just like this self inflicted pain that's occurring over and over when we work out down the road that can lead to injury, burnout, in sustainability and also what plays along with that which i won't touch into because i want to get to the next one but remember i said this one this wound doesn't really care about pleasure they're like i just want to get the job done and i'll be fine i don't need to be super happy or like feeling good like i just want i just want the thing done um what happens is if the body isn't feeling pleasure if the body's feeling pain um, and all of that aggression is constantly coming at the body it's going to register that it's not safe and when it registers that it's not safe, remember, body's number one job is to keep you alive. So it will do whatever it can to get you away from the thing that feels dangerous. So if you're making your body feel like it's in danger <laughs> when you're exercising really hard, it will do whatever to keep you from that. So that's when you'll see extreme um, lethargy. You'll you'll see like oversleeping a lot. You'll see... Um, what they'll think is laziness, but it's really the body trying to keep you away from that workout because it's like, I don't know what she's going to do to me next. Um, it can be seen as like mood swings and extreme cravings. That's another thing. Like if you go low carb for too long, the body doesn't feel safe either. We're going to get into that another time, a uh, different masterclass. But yeah, so, so that's something else to consider with that wound. Okay, number five, the rule maker. This one is the both. This one is both um, a, male, a father and a mother wound. Story, the core story created by the mother and father wound of the rule maker. Rules keep me safe. Stay in bounds. Play it safe. How it happened. Uh, the, the child grew up in a place of chaos. Again, this can be subtle. This can be extreme. It's the whole gamut and it's all valid and all has a place here, okay? You have a place here and this wound of yours does as well. Um, and we're exploring it with curiosity, not with shame, not with guilt, not with self-condemnation. Okay, so um, the adult grew up, you know, when they were young, they, like their upbringing was mayhem or it was subtle mayhem. And this could have been experienced as an alcoholic parent it could have been experienced as a parent you had to like maybe just walk on eggshells around maybe because they had crazy mood swings. Maybe the parent had anger issues. Um, maybe the parent just felt slightly out of control in another sense. Like it doesn't have to be as serious. Of course, this has a place too. like as a like a, um, a drug addict parent. It can be a lot more mild, like maybe the parent could never get their finances in order. And there was always this like state of like kind of overwhelm or unrest or like you didn't know what the next thing would be, or maybe they were moving a lot. Maybe the, you know, the person, the parent was in the military and they just, it wasn't, they were a responsible, good, stable parent. They just had to move a lot. That's just the way it was. And for whatever reason, the child felt like they couldn't get their bearings. They couldn't get their footing. Um, there was, maybe there was like, like just messiness. Maybe it was a really disorganized house. Maybe things were just like left out and, you know, ends weren't tied up and, um, you know, people, kids weren't picked up at school on time and stuff like that. Uh, unpredictability, you know, um, so the, the child rearing process, you know, lacked a lot of structure, basically how this shows up in life. You guess it. You're a real. You're a rule maker, and you stick to rules. Um, you can be overly structured, rigid, reliable, left brain. Um, pleasure also for you is not a super high priority. You just want to make sure that you're abiding by the rules, because then you'll feel like, okay, I, I did everything I could do to stay safe, and to do the thing that is required of me and expected of me. Um, Laying it safe is is paramount for you. So the gifts are: you're great at saving money. Oftentimes, you're great at budgeting sticking to a budget. You're often very professional. Um, 
challenges, you can feel empty. It can feel like a life not worth living, a life that's just left brain and there's no creativity, there's no play, there's no flow within the structure coming, coming into your life. It can feel like rigid and there's this other part of you that's coming up that you're still trying to squash down because you're like, no, 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 you're going to get in the way of me following the rules. But there's this other, you are a creator. So there's this other part of you that's like, but I want to do this. And you're just like, oh, so that's not, that's not sustainable, right? And you guessed it, sustainability and fitness. That's what we're after. Oh, another uh, challenge. Oftentimes the rule maker is not very in touch with their emotions. So they can stuff and suppress them rather than express them, process them, speak about them, own their truth in that way. Um, they can be very far removed from them, like very, very far removed that it's going to take a process just to touch upon one or two. Okay. Um, and of course, underneath it all, it's, there's this feeling of like, we're not worthy of having emotions for whatever happened in the child, you know, in childhood, or we're not, there's no place for it. We're not safe to express. Okay. So here's the gifts and fitness. You're going to follow that plan to a T you're going to be so structured. You're going to be so on point. You're going to, what's the calorie count? What's the macro? Like, bada bing, bada boom. Right? So these are our, like, figure and bodybuilding competitors for sure. Oftentimes, these are, like, the ones that are, like, we make our bodies into this, like, mathematical equation. And we're, like, it has nothing to do with the metabolism down-regulating its processes because I've been low-carb for, like, since 1982. It's, or, you know, whatever, 1992, maybe. It's, it's like, no, we, we have other things going on. Like, stress is a thing. Stress can keep weight on. Stress can also help you lose weight. Stress is like more of a fluid gray area and rule makers don't like gray areas. So they want to, they want to push that square peg into a round hole. They want to make their bodies do the thing. Well, I checked off all the boxes. I follow the plan. Now body, like you're supposed to hold up your end of the bargain, but we never stopped to ask the customer, which is our body, what it actually wants. And the body, it expresses that through feeling, sensation, emotion. But if we're not connected to that, because we're just focused on rules up here, then we're never going to be able to like really create something that will be sustainable no matter what. It's a, it's a weird concept for rule makers to understand that some flow and some fluidity is the answer to the ultimate sustainability. There has to be a blend of both. And, and that balance is individual. There's going to be a different balance for each person. And so with that, I want to have respect for the balance of the rule maker wound. This person can create sustainability, following more rules and being more in their left brain and checking things off the to-do list and checking out, you know, following their macros and things. They can have sustainability with more of that stuff than some of these other wounds. And some of, more than just like your standard person that's not heavily wounded in any area, that's maybe has a blend of some tiny stuff coming online, but it's nothing major. Um, the rule maker can actually create sustainability because they truly enjoy, they've learned how to enjoy counting calories. They've learned how to enjoy looking at their sleep app and being like, I was in REM sleep for this many cycles, and then I'm going to drink this many ounces of water, and then I'm going to pee this many, you know, times, and like... They like that. And if you enjoy something, there's your pleasure and pleasure equals sustainability. So that's what I'm saying there. So for the rule maker, it's about them really making sure that they strike their own balance, not being afraid of their emotions, doing a little bit more connecting in, and they're just going to be so much more grounded and not so heady that way. And then, um, making sure like the, you know, intuitive eating, I'll just say intuitive eating is not like a crowd pleaser with this crew. <laughs> they may never like embark upon something like that. Um, so the only thing I will say that, uh, lastly, that rule makers get to really be mindful of is if you do go off the rails, because that's life, you're going to go to a wedding at some point, you're going to go to a birthday party, you're going to go to another country and there won't be access to a gym or a treadmill or whatever. It's going to rain for four days in a row or snow 
14 inches and it's going to take away your like running schedule for a moment. These things are going to happen. What rule makers do, I know this sounds crazy out loud, but rule makers create stories from these instances outside of their control that they create stories that this is a deficiency on their part or that they're doing something wrong. If I had only planned better, if I had only just figured this out a little bit better, then everything would be, all the trains would be running on time. No, 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 no. That's how life is sometimes. So there's another one I'm going to go over. This is the last, the seventh wound is uh, an opposite. Man, I need to do less stuff and less content in the future. It's a long one, but um, the, the last one I'm going to go over is like um, a, like an avoidance of self-responsibility. This, this one, the rule maker, it's like taking away a little bit of the responsibility on, on their own shoulders all the time and realizing that sometimes life is just up to chance and things are coincidental and, you know, just do the best you can. Cool. All right. Number six, perfectionism. That's the wound. Perfectionism. That's the core wound. We're going to go with father in this case. Obviously, it can be both because this has a very pushy masculine energy, this wound. So that's why I'm going with father. However, there are many moms who embody a lot of that masculine energy. And they, fathers and mothers, they're doing the best they could. Oftentimes, mothers will embody that masculine energy because they're a single parent. And they have to be both mom and dad. So doing the best they can. Just constant reminders on that. This is not a slight on any parents. Parents are going to screw up. They're human. Okay. It's up to us to take the, take the baton, do our own self-development, and heal. Perfectionism, father, story. Here's the core story shaped from the wound. I must hustle for my worth. I must constantly grind. I am only as valuable as my achievements, my accolades, um, or the quality of my execution. What is this like really, what's the core story really behind this? It's pretty simple. It's I'm never enough. I'm not enough just as I am. There's never a energy of like, come as you are. It's always a like a performance. What are you going to do to earn my love? Okay, dad, I'll go like be an all-star on the basketball team. Okay, dad, I'll go get straight A's. Again, father was doing he was trying to keep you safe. He was trying to help you be a successful adult. But sometimes there's this like vibe of love is only doled out once the child accomplishes something. When the child does something right, finishes a chore, gets a good grade, then the love is, is given. But the love is withheld until that thing is accomplished. Until that child proves themselves worthy of the love. Make sense? Not wrong or right. It's just what happened. Oftentimes, uh, so it's a very performance-based love. It's very like contractual. That's the vibe. Like, what are you? What are you doing for this love? What are you gonna do to make this family, uh, you know, whatever, have whatever the family needs? What are? How are you gonna show up and perform so that this family is good? And then we'll love you for it. Okay, life. The expectation is I am loved for my achievement. So people show up in the workplace ready to go. Like they're very well equipped for a masculine workplace. And there's a lot of proof behind this core wounding and the patterns that play out that the person can achieve success this way. So this is like so common, so common in my work. Um, and I love it. I love all these overachieving women that come into L3 Method and they... <laughs> And they're like total perfectionists. And they're like, wait a second, the same pushy masculine energy that I utilize to like get my way to the top and prove myself at work isn't going to work with my feminine body? No, it's not. <laughs> no, the body's like, ha, that's cute. But like, I'm queen. I'm so much wiser than you and your little like core stories. I know what's best and you clearly do not. So I'm going to just keep showing you by keeping the weight on by having the aches and pains, by being bloated, I'm just going to try to keep giving you these messages until you wake up and realize that you get to listen to me in order for, like, you get to listen to the customer, the client, the body, before you get what you want from this exchange. 
Okay, so um, before we get more into fitness, I want to just like lay context for the rest of kind of life aspects. Um, there's a very all or nothing feel, and this is because no one is perfect. So when the, when the woman, man, however you identify, when they realize, oh my God, I, I got, I started this new thing. I started this new workout program and I just realized like there's a learning curve and I'm not going to be perfect right out of the gate. So they'll disappear. They'll just flee the scene. They will just quit. There'll be like this total ghost factor that happens because they're like, I am not perfect. I'm going to be seen. Like I'm going to be seen for me, flawed and all. Like I don't, I don't know all the answers here. I don't know how to be perfect in this scenario. So F it, like I'm out. This is too scary because it truly is scary. For someone who was raised in that type of um, transactional love household, it's really scary to show up with like nothing to bring to the table, which obviously is not true. You showing up and just being you is enough. But people with this wound, especially when they're like deep in the wound, they don't understand this. Oh my God, if I don't do this perfectly, if I don't lose the weight in one month and be the success story, then my coach is going to like think I'm worthless or I'm going to think I'm worthless or my social media following will think I'm worthless. I don't know what I'm going to do. So I'm just like, I'm just going to peace out because this is really scary to be seen as like a flawed, normal, imperfect, like learning human who's evolving. <laughs> um, so perfectionism, as you probably know, if you've done self-development work and you're a perfectionist yourself, zero judgment, I'm here with you. Um, deep feelings of inadequacy are behind that per perfectionism trait. Um, so how else this shows up in life is there's a really big blockage with intimacy. Here's why. Perfectionists can never let their hair down. They can never be seen as just them in their personal lives. Therefore, they think that the only way that their loved ones will love them, because this is what they were taught, is through their parents' lens, no fault of theirs, is the only way I'm going to be loved is if I perform, if I show up, if I hide my inadequacies, if I am perfect. And when you just, when you can't let your hair down and just be you, messy and, you know, unscripted and all, then what happens are these, there are these very empty relationships when it's always like transactional and I get it. I've, I'm there. Like, I don't know, you know, there's a lack of understanding, like, wait, this person will just love me. And it's like, and I don't have to do anything to receive that love or like, wait a second. I've found myself doing this one in my personal relationships. I will admit, and it's vulnerable of me to, to say so, but, um, oh my God, this person did three nice things for me. They ran an errand. They listened to me on the phone for an hour and um, they showed me, you know, how to like make this smoothie. I haven't done anything nice for them lately. Oh my God. Like I have to like, I have to give them compliments. I have to go return the favor. And this is the gift in this is there's that consideration. It's beautiful. Like the person's never going to be selfish. They're like, what can I do for this person? How can I contribute to this relationship? How can I show up and provide value here? But there's so much more value in you just being you than in you trying to fill a role. Okay. Um, so yeah, so the lack of intimacy can create this big hole in your center. Like you feel empty, kind of like the rule maker. Um, like you're missing that real human connection, but you don't know how to get it. So you just want to be loved, flaws and all. Let's see what else I have here. It's scary to do that. So this is also coming into context with like women who, that whole thing of like women don't believe they can have it all. They don't believe they can have that successful marriage and have like a successful career. They feel like they have to sacrifice in one of the other or the family. And obviously there's so many women these days like blowing that out of the water. They're, they're definitely having it all. Um, but that's still something that people are working through. I know that is the case for me. And the reason why is because they're so used to showing up at work where they get rewarded like they did in childhood to being like to doing and being successful and chasing the next carrot and the accolades and like boom, 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 boom and climbing that ladder. And it's very masculine and it's very um F your feelings, go for it anyway. Like it doesn't matter how you feel. This is what needs to get done. So do it and then we'll reward you, yada, yada. 
then you carry that into a personal relationship, which is completely different. And then people under people don't understand or don't they can't figure out why there's like a lack of human connection and why they don't feel close to that other person. Okay, here's the beautiful, quirky, weird, woo-woo thing of how this shows up in fitness. If you are experiencing a lack of intimacy, I know it's like we went from perfectionism all the way to like, where how do we get from here to here? You can rewind this if you need. <laughs> um, if you're experiencing a lack of intimacy, guess what's also happening on the sidelines? Likely there's a lack of intimacy that you're experiencing with yourself. So if you aren't comfortable with your own body, if you don't have this intimate knowing and understanding of your own body, if you are uncomfortable being alone, if you're, I'm going to just, this is great. I can't believe I'm saying this, but to all my women out there, this isn't directly fitness, but this is your body. If you're uncomfortable looking at your yoni, if you're looking at like your private area, if you're uncomfortable looking at that, which our society has taught us to, to be uncomfortable, like being familiar with that area, looking at it, gazing at it, that's a lack of intimacy with oneself. And if we don't know thyself, we can't go forward into a relationship and show up fully authentically because we don't truly know who we are. We don't truly know how good it feels, how sensual it feels to be in our own body. So if this is pinging you and triggering you right now, like, oh my God, like feeling good in my own body and like feeling sensual with myself, like that's an indicator right there that um, there's like a discomfort with maybe your femininity or some other piece or a mul multitude of pieces. Zero judgment, I have been there, I get it. Um, okay, so fitness. Uh, outside of the intimacy with one's own body, again, connection there so that we can deliver what is needed to truly lose the weight. Intimacy can show up with, what does your evening routine look like? Here's how this plays into fitness. Oof, here's a good one. Your sleep is the foundation for your workouts, for you having lower ghrelin levels so you're not craving crazy stuff all day. Your sleep is great for cognitive functioning. Quality sleep is so important. If you don't have an evening routine in place that caters to lowering like the voices, the critic, the, the, the noise in your head and getting your mind into a peaceful state so that the body can follow suit, you're not gonna get the quality sleep. If you don't have intimacy with yourself, if you're not comfortable being alone and feeling into what feels good in your body and just like, doing something for the pleasure of it at night, something that's just for you. If you're filling the night with, with noise and TV and social media scrolling because you're not comfortable being alone with yourself, that's going to affect your quality of sleep. That's going to affect your ability to burn fat at night and to build muscle tone. That's going to affect your ability to have maximum energy, to have really good workouts that will produce results during the day. And that's going to affect your ability to stay on track and not have cravings because your body's going to be looking for external sources of energy via fat and sugar because um, it's not getting quality sleep. Boom! Correlated that one. <laughs> um, yeah, but uh, the other thing that happens is there's a procrastination. We talked about this earlier. So with the perfectionist, they are like, oh my gosh, I don't feel perfect. I don't feel like I can do this like, like a pro right out of the gate. So I'm just going to like hold off on this because it's scary to not show up perfect. And there's a procrastination and there's a procrastination and there's a pushing away and it gets longer and longer and longer. And then the thing never gets done because the expectation in the person's head is so high, so unattainably high when if they just took these baby steps and just admitted, you know what, I'm going to mess up. This is something new I've never done before. If you ever tried snowboarding, you're not going to be perfect right out of the gates. Sometimes if you haven't been fit for a long time, it can feel like that. It can feel like snowboarding for the first time as an, as an adult. It can feel like doing ballet for the first time as an adult or salsa or something like that. And that's really scary for the perfectionist. And it's okay, but I challenge you, and I, I, I don't want to say I challenge you. I invite you. How about that? That's, that feels softer. I invite you to um, 
try out um, try out those baby steps, those imperfect imperfection, those imperfect baby steps, one foot in front of the other, and then that's going to add up to a really big result that you will love. Um, questions to ask? I think we covered that. I wanna I wanna go to the last one because we have really been going over time. Okay. Dramatic, this is the last one, Seven. the seventh wound. Dramatic victimization or martyrdom. So dramatic martyrdom or dramatic, being a dramatic victim. The story, it's not my fault. I'm not responsible. I have the worst luck. Something always gets in my way. I try so hard and it's just not meant for me. I'll never have the thing I want. I'll never look the way I want. I'll never be that fit person that I want to be. It's just, it's not in the cards for me. Um, how it happened. There's so many ways. Um, oftentimes our mother, um, that's what she knew. She knew how to play victim and, again. And that like, that has such a foul con connotation with it. And I get that. So just, our ego, our pride, just like I said in the beginning that we're only as evolved as the least evolved part of our mothers, it can really sting the pride and the ego. I don't want to believe that, but, and I don't want to believe that I show up as a victim, but I do, I do sometimes. So have compassion with yourself and just have this honest, curious, not self-shaming, but this curious space to explore this with. Okay, maybe I should have named it something else to be less like irritating and pingy and triggery, but that's what I came up with. Um, so maybe mom knew how to be vi victim. She knew how to be martyr. She knew how to like slave away on the, sto the stove and like cook the big meal and like not get any sleep and put everyone's needs before her own. And then, you know, oh, well, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't take care of myself because everyone else needed things. And, th and that's obvious. That's like, very rooted in truth oftentimes for sure but it's all like framing too you know there's that element of framing and self-responsibility there's a there's a blend that gets to take place the rule maker makes everything their own fault the, the dramatic victim makes nothing their own fault right so there's something that gets to come up somewhere in the middle that's going to likely serve us best and that balance that middle point will be different for each person um so another thing is i just want to be mindful there's a DNA and a lineage that we're up against. There may have been decades, maybe centuries of women who only knew how to play that martyrdom victim role. And that's what served them. That's what kept them safe and alive. And that's why we're here, you know, the decisions that they made. But just like DNA is gonna determine the features on our face, where body fat shows up on our body, especially for women, um, you know, most naturally, also, DNA takes place with the brain cells forming and the cognitive processes, the, the, the part of the brain that keeps us safe, that's like more fear-based, um, that has a DNA attachment. Like there, there are things that are passed down to us that have nothing to do with your current reality. And so just be mindful that it's, you're, you're never going to know exactly what happened or like what cave kept them safe from what intruder or what animal or what, you know, what it was that they were trying to stay safe from, or they, um, you know, had as a very real threat in their lives, but those things are at play and they're still here a little bit, but they're not going to make up your whole personality. They're just a, pers a, a smaller percentage of what goes into your total, you know, thinking and decision-making. Okay. Um, but yeah, there's decades of wounding, self-limiting beliefs, uh, from mothers, grandmothers, and so on, who have done no self-development work at all. Oh, by the way, this is a, this is a, um, a mother wound. Sorry, I forgot to say that. And I didn't type that in right here. Mother wound. Okay. Uh, so coping mechanisms, uh, were put into place so that it's kind of like never our fault because our ego doesn't want to admit that like, oh my gosh, like I haven't been fit in six years and it's because of me. We don't want to feel that way. But we're like, well, no, it's because of this and because of this and because of that. I throw your hands up. I, could, I couldn't do anything about it. Like it's just, so again, there's some truth in this. There were, are things that came up. There are difficult things that came up and there's a reframe that gets to take, take place so that you can take your empowerment back so that you can take back your destiny.
Because as, as long as you're going to be the victim, you can't do anything about it. Because then it's just like, it's happening to you, not for you. And you, you, you can't move forward and you can't be the one who writes the script in your own life. Okay. So how does this show up in life? There will be a range of the following emotions, disempowerment, sadness, rage, anxiety, lots of drama. And it will be constant swirling around you and you will be attracting this like a magnet. Uh, you make mountains out of mole, mole hills. People have said you're a drama queen sometimes, perhaps. There's a deferment constantly of blame, lack of self-responsibility, pessimism. Oftentimes life sucks. Lots of sighing. Lots of just, <sighs> it happened to me again, you know? Okay, fitness, gifts. You have awareness. That's a huge gift. You know what went wrong and what's currently going wrong. So oftentimes victims are also very intelligent. This was me for sure. Like I knew everything that was going wrong. Like I knew, um, okay. It just paused because of poor connection, but hopefully I'm back. Um, you know, I, I, I did my own self-diagnosis and I like was my own therapist and I knew every, I was like, oh, well, this happened to me and then this happened to me and then this happened to me. And then like, you know, there you go. Now there's this like mountain on top of me and how am I ever going to move forward? So you have a lot of awareness. That's a definite gift. Challenges, um, not taking that self-responsibility like we just talked about. So there's like, a, here's examples. There's a dramatization that takes place. So oftentimes this, this wound will exaggerate. They'll say like, I did this many reps at the gym. I did, deadlifted this much weight for this many reps. And I was so perfect with my diet. I don't understand what happened when in reality, it's a dramatization. They didn't do that much, didn't, didn't do that many reps. They weren't perfect with their diet, but there's this kind of like overhaul or a glazing over of the, the facts. And it's how can we shape the facts to like be supportive of our reality, to be supportive of our dramatic story. So, um, and going along with that, oftentimes when I'm coaching this wound, this person who has this type of wound, um, they get really stuck in story. So when I ask a simple question about, you know, their eating, I'll get this whole long response about every single thing that they ate, except for the things that are actually causing the issue. So like, I'll get all, I'll, I ate a salad, then I had this, then I had an omelet, then I did da, 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 and like I fasted and then I drank water and then I had, you know, this um, black bean, you know, whatever. And then I had this casserole, and just, but then they leave out conveniently. Well, I had ice cream like every night and I had this cheesecake and um, I ate this steak with like butter all over it and whatever. So the mind will like take us on a ride and it, it can be really, really subtle sometimes. And it's okay. Again, I, I've run this before, 100%. I've been a drama queen with my own fitness for sure. But just having awareness around it is, is the key. And just like, oh, okay, like we don't have to get so mad at ourselves. Oh my God, here I go again. Like I'm a drama queen. Everyone's gonna see right through me. Everyone's gonna realize that I'm making stuff up. <laughs> um, I caught myself there. But it doesn't have to be all that. I can just be like, oh, that's cute. Like there's that protector within me that's trying to keep me safe again. Or, oh, there's that small child that's like trying to make everything really exciting to divert people from something I'm trying to keep them, keep them from, some part of my truth. Um, so how else this presents in fitness is if we aren't ready to really come to a place where we're like, okay, I'm going to be honest with myself. This is what's happening now. We're, we're honest and aware of our past we're not honest and aware of how we're proliferating this story in the present. And if we can't take ownership of that, then we can't make the changes to move forward. Okay, I know that you understand this. Um, also, they'll self-sabotage in the, in the sense like, well, this happened to me and it was so horrible. So therefore, I went off the rails for a whole week and I didn't work out. And I stayed up late every night and watched Netflix and I lost all my gains. So you know, there's, there's truth in that and you get to have compassion, but then the drama, the dramatic martyr or victim who is a martyr to the circumstances gets to find a healthier, more empowered way to self-soothe and to, um, to stay on course, even when horrible stuff's happening to them. It's like, you're honestly setting a boundary from the old energies that you are attracting so that the new ones can kind of come in and take root in your life. 
Okay. So this one's really hard for the ego, like we mentioned, because with victimhood, like the ego identifies with it so much. Oh my God, all this stuff is always happening to me. That's like part of the identity. So therefore, if we decide that we're no longer going to do that and we're going to take responsibility, a part of our ego, a part of our identity dies and people will fight for what they identify with. So if they're identifying, just like the perfectionist, I know I'm going to a different wound, but the perfectionist will, the plus side of the perfectionist is they will fight to have the fit body. They will try their best because they identify with being perfect. So they will give it their all. On the flip side, the victim or the martyr will give it their all to keep alive that story that it's not going to happen for them. Um, so then there's this, you know, this failure to launch that always occurs. Um, and then they never get to their goal. Um, then also there's this, so this is something I even more deeply resonate with. With the victim, there's a, a next layer to it that is the wounded warrior complex, which is weird. But I know no judgment, I have this. So it's like, I want to show up and I want to be the warrior that saves the day. I want to be the superhero. And then that way, other people will look at me like, oh, thank you so much. And then I'll get my needs met in this like, like layered, twisted almost way because I feel good now. I feel valuable. I feel significant because people are like, thank you so much for doing the thing. You are a hero. And then the wounded warrior is the one who's like, I'm fighting for the good cause. But there's this victimhood that takes place because instead of like defaulting to, you know, this upsurge of action, and of course that this has its place, this energy absolutely has its place. If there's something dangerous happening, take action, let's go. But if there's this constant like, oh, I did the thing and then nobody appreciates me and, or I like saved the day or I, I deadlifted all this weight, but I'm still not like seeing my hamstrings pop through or like I did all of this. I like broke every record da, 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 and it still wasn't enough. That's that wounded warrior. That's like a, another layer of the victimhood. So just being aware of that as well. Um, it's like a weird further distortion. And that's really all I got for you guys. So I hope, I hope that was helpful. And I don't mean to be all, you know, cheery in the way that I'm like, this is all I have. Like, this is, you know, very, very tender, serious stuff. Um, I hope that I hope that it helped shed some light. I hope that it helped um, along with the course of self forgiveness and self understanding and awareness and forgiveness of others who played a role in your past to shape who you are today and also appreciation for those important people as well. And uh, I hope this made your fitness journey or I hope it will make your fitness journey a little bit easier. And the next masterclass I do, I'm definitely going to put less information. I try to pack so much information because I really want this to be beneficial and valuable, but maybe I'm, per maybe that's my wound. Maybe I'm performing a little too much. <laughs> um, and so next time I promise my master class will maybe be a little bit more concise. I love you all so much. Um, I appreciate you for taking all this time. If you're still here listening, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. May you be well. Many blessings. Mwah. Bye.